I've taught self-defense and survival techniques for years now. And beyond the, you know, physical application of fighting, you know, learning how to defend yourself with technique, martial arts, there's a bunch of stuff that I've learned that I think everyone can apply instantly in the sense that by all means, if you have the capacity and the desire and the interest and the physicality and all of that sort of stuff, the money to be able to afford it, find yourself a good Brazilian Jiu Jitsu dojo and start training. However, there's, there's a bunch more and potentially more important things that you can do to keep yourself safe. So in this episode, I just want to break down some of the things that you can do as a general thing to, to, to keep yourself safe beyond physically practicing how to fight. I do it because I love it and it's social and it's physical and all of that sort of stuff, but I feel like there's more to it. And, and the first thing I want to suggest is to trust your intuition. If you think someone is dodgy, if you feel just in your gut that you can't trust this person or the situation, leave. Trust that feeling. I like to look at this from an evolutionary perspective. We evolved from animals and animals act off instinct alone. And, and a lot of the times the, the prey animals, you know, the ones that get eaten, they will run at times when they think there's danger, but there's actually not, but they're doing that to keep themselves safe. If you run away from a lion five times and only one of those times is a real lion, you're still keeping yourself safe. So how does this apply itself for humans in modern society? There's been stories where people have let people into their houses or, you know, been alone in a elevator and held the door open for someone that they felt like they shouldn't. And the reason they felt like they shouldn't is this just, they might not be able to put it into words. They might not be able to justify the reasoning, but for whatever reason, they feel uneasy. But then something happens, they, they, their rational mind starts kicking in and go, they go, oh, I don't want to be racist or sexist or I don't want to be rude. So I'm going to override my animal instincts and let this potentially dangerous person in. It's far better to come across as rude when you get that feeling than to have to deal with a violent situation, to have to deal with a dodgy person. There's, there's things that you need to consider. You know, so if you're alone, if you're in your car or in your house or in an elevator and you're alone and you get this feeling, that's the time to ev evoke the rudeness. That's the time to just keep to yourself, to avoid the person, you know, to, to, cross, the, to cross the road. This doesn't mean that you're sexist or racist or biased in some capacity. What it means is that you're making sure that you're safe. It doesn't mean that you have you know, you, you're promoting anything that will put a certain group down or certain people down. What it means is that you're trusting your gut. A lot of the time, you can't quite know and put into words why you feel a certain way. But any anytime you meet someone, someone online or in person, you'll get a feeling about them. And that feeling is usually pretty on point about the person. You know, some people just feel a bit untrustworthy. Some people seem dangerous. Some people, you, you might want to put it a bit of an edge. Some people, they seem nice enough, but you don't like them, right? Trust that feeling. Trust it. Because the reason you know this is, the reason you know to trust this feeling is, is you've seen hundreds, thousands of people in the course of a day and weeks and months and years. You, you've seen many people. And most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't get this feeling and you're safe. But there's that slight time, that some time that you do get the feeling. So when you do get the feeling, that's actually different from the norm. There's something about this person or the situation that doesn't sit right. And you should act and you should act to leave yourself. You should take yourself out of the situation and go. Now, how do you differentiate that between general anxiety or an anxiety disorder? How do you know that you're not just avoiding everyone. Well, it becomes down to a matter of occurrence. If you're avoiding everyone all the time and you're always getting this bad feeling, that's not intuition, that's anxiety. And there's a difference. And the more you sort of consider this, the more you'll start to see the difference. One's an intuitive feeling like this person's, oh, I don't trust them. 
and the other one's a generalized social anxiety. They distinctly feel different. So I encourage you to keep thinking and investigating that. If you're always thinking that everyone is a problem, the problem's probably internal to you. But if you're genuinely, genuinely, generally fine, and then, then someone triggers this intuitive gut awkwardness, stay away, unsafe feeling, trust it. Trust it. The second thing that I would suggest from a mental state perspective to keep yourself safe is to act confidently, even if you don't feel it. Stand up straight, shoulders back, walk with a purpose. Don't be distracted. You've got to think to yourself, well, what what would somebody that's wanting to victimize someone, what are they what are they looking for? They're they're the you know, they're a predator in this sense. What what sort of prey are they looking for? And once again, go evolutionary. They're looking for someone that is an easy target. If you're hunting, do you hunt the strongest animal or do you hunt the, the, the weaker, the older, the younger, right? You're, you go, go, you're going for the easier target to guarantee the kill. Sounds callous, but you need to get yourself into this mind frame if you're wanting to protect yourself. So what does that mean? It means for you, you need to stand with confidence. You need to walk with confidence. You need to not be distracted. You know, so if you're sitting there looking at your phone, it's night time, you're looking at your phone, headphones in, and you're walking late at night on your own, you're distracted, you've blinded yourself, you can't hear, and you've isolated yourself. That seems like a potentially easy target. Similarly, if you're walking and you're hunched over and you just, quote, look like a victim, you're more likely to be victimized. And they've done studies on prisoners and they've shown people prisoners videos of just crowds. And they said, who would you target and why? And Basically, they're always choosing the same people, the ones that look withdrawn and look, quote unquote, like a victim. I'm hesitant to say this on this podcast and talk about these words in this sense because, you know, there's that idea of victim blaming and victim, you know, shaming and all of that sort of stuff. It's no one's fault that they're attacked. It's, you know, people shouldn't be attacked or victimized or anything like that. But if you look at the, the, the you know, in the real world, these things happen. And then considering they do happen, you can look at why they happen, who's more likely to be targeted and how you can avoid that. And the best way to do that is to walk and act with confidence and with purpose. This is one of the benefits that I think people get from a martial arts practice. I know that I can protect myself physically. If it came down to it in a fight, I, I feel safe. I'm a strong young man and I can actually do fighting. However, I don't have to ever prove that because I don't look like a victim. I look strong, I walk with confidence, and I'm upright. Now, you can still project confidence even if you're not physically fit. You can still project confidence even if you don't have an iota of how to protect yourself. It's, lit it's literally postural and working with walking with purpose. If you sit upright, head up, and go. Like you're meaning to go somewhere. You just look far more confident. And it doesn't have to be confidence from a martial art. It can be confidence in any field that will make you look look just stronger and better and more protected. You will look less like an easy target. Just stand up straight, go with purpose. And if someone does start, you know, verbally, you know, starts the verbal probing on you, firm, sharp words. Speak with confidence and let them know that you're not going to be an easy person to deal with. No, stop. I have a friend coming, right? There, there are specific words and phrases that you can use to project yourself and not necessarily even what you're saying, but how you say it. Speak, walk, act with confidence. On a more... On more specific event, in more more specific way to keep yourself safe, will be if something does happen, if you are attacked, if you do feel like you need to act, act quickly. The, the sooner you act, and the more violently you act, the more shocking it is to the person you know, doing the attacking. If someone if someone attacks you and you respond with loud volumes and you start, you know, scratching, punching, biting, doing anything you can to get away super quick, you've got more of a chance than waiting. Once again, studies suggest that if you wait, 
if you go to a secondary location, so if you let someone take you from one place to another place, or if you wait that, t that, that, that time frame, or and if you don't fight back, worse stuff in general happens. Obviously, we are only playing on statistics here. But if you think about it, if someone does something and you respond back, bang, super hard, super fast, with volume, with yelling, with noise, with you know, violence of movement, you're surprising them. You're not acting that in that typical sense. Without getting too technical on how to strike, close a fist and put your hard bits, head, elbows, fists, knees, feet, into their soft bits. Eyes, nose, throat, groin, repeatedly. Hard bits into their soft bits, repeatedly. Go, 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 until you can run. From a more typical masculine perspective, you know, men often sort of arc up and they become this sort of, you know, monkey primal <laughs> rage thing where they're, you know, arcing up, arcing up, arcing up, and then they become a fight. The worst thing you can do is to get into a physical altercation because you don't know where it's going to end. You don't know how it's going to end. You don't know who the person is. You don't know their, their, their training background. You don't know their strength. You don't know if they've got friends. You don't know if they've got a weapon. The best thing you can do is avoid the situation. If you think something's getting out of hand, just leave, okay? Use your words to de-escalate. You've got nothing to prove. And, and you know, there's this temptation, like, oh, this person's being rude, this person's being mean, I'll give them, you know, give them a spray. Uh, you're risking it. What do you get by fighting someone? You know, this is from, you know, that typical masculine perspective. I say masculine, not male, because it can happen with females as well. But what do you get from actually fighting someone in the street, right? You get to, you know, sway your ego. <sighs> I don't know if that's worth it. I don't know if that's worth the risk. And even if you do, quote unquote, win the fight, what do you actually win? You win probably physical damage to yourself, and you probably get a lawsuit or at least have to deal with the, you know, the legal ramifications. Even if you're attacked, if that person leaves worse for wear, you could be legally responsible. You know, obviously, depending on where you are, you know, in country-wise and what happens, it doesn't. it's not worth the risk. Wear it all possible. Use your words to de-escalate. If that doesn't help, physically run. I train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a grappling art. I used to do striking, which is like punching and kicking. But what I realized was that in a self-defense situation, I've got my words, and then I've got the ability to knock you out. Zero to 100. But if I'm in a punch-on match, if you haven't grabbed me and I'm striking, I can just run. And, you know, once again, I don't know the legality of where you are, but if you start fighting someone and you could run, you're now engaging in that fight, right? If you have the opportunity to leave and you choose not to and you choose to keep coming back in, are you defending yourself or are you fighting now? It could be argued either way. So I would suggest that you run. Now, the reason I train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is, is that if someone grabs me, I now need to break those grips away so I can then run. The only, proviso, the only sort of difference here is if you've got friends and family that are more vulnerable than you that you need to protect. And, and if that happens, I would suggest prior to this, have the conversation with your friends and family. Have the conversation with the wife and the kids. If this happens, what should we do? So I've had the conversation with my wife. If something is to happen, if we're on a train or walking around and a guy or a group of guys decides to, you know, get physical, what do we do? And I've said to her, you take our son and run. Don't look back. Don't think of me. Just get out of here. Get to safety. Call the cops straight away. Why have I said this? Well, like I said, I train, so I've got a little bit of a chance to be able to defend myself. Long enough for her and my you know, young son to be able to escape, which does a couple of things. I know that they're away, so I don't have to think about them anymore, and I can just deal with the problem at hand using words to de-escalate and hopefully not physicality. But it, it guarantees their safety. It gets the cops coming straight away, right? Which definitely does help. And it means that I don't have to focus on dealing with them. The reason this is important is, is one time something started happening and my wife grabbed my arms as in hugged me, you know, because she was a bit afraid. Now, 
although that might help her emotionally in the moment, that restricted the use of my arm. She's now attached to my arm, so I had to shake her off to have my arms free to be able to deal with the threat in front of me. So what I realized is we had to have the conversation of what to do. Now your solution with your physicality and age and gender and all of that sort of stuff will be different. I can't give you specific advice because I don't know your specific circumstances. But what I can suggest is to just have a bit of a game plan. What will you do if, right? If you're in a car and someone comes in, lock the doors. Yeah, it's very hard to break into a car. Lock the doors, drive away, right? If you're on your own, what's your plan? If you're with other people, what's your plan? If it's in your home, what's your plan? Have a general idea. If you've never thought about it, you're going to be thinking about it on the spot and that could lead to danger. The, 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 there's, there's something that happens with any sort of conflict or any sort of heightened emotionality is we go into a fight or flight or freeze response. Basically when something happens, and this is when, when people are anxious, their, their fight, flight, freeze response, their uh, sympathetic nervous system is on. So basically your body's getting ready to act. Your pupils dilate so you can see more. Blood goes to your muscles, you stop um, you stop digesting. You know, you might let, you might pee yourself. You might crap yourself, right? Because your, your body is getting ready to act. And there's three things that your body does. Gets you ready to fight, i.e. physically fight back, to flee around the situation, but also you can freeze. And you see this in the animal kingdom. Animals fight, they run, and they freeze. And the reason they freeze is because they know that if they freeze, the animal, the, you know, the predator might move on or it might mitigate the damage. So humans have those responses. And out of those three responses, the freeze response is the most deadly, it's the most dangerous for you in the sense that if you need to act, freezing is almost never, almost never the best idea. There are, there are occasions that I've heard people in sort of active shooter situations, you know, when there's a gunman, that freezing is the best situation. You're just literally hiding. But in general, you want to be able to do something. So having a plan of what you're going to do is optimal. What will you do in certain situations? I suggest if, you, if the person wants to take you somewhere or they want something from you, as in if someone's trying to rob me and take my stuff, have it, go for it, it's insured, it doesn't matter, right? However, if you want my body, if you want me or you want my family, now we're fighting, right? I'm going to, you know, go stupid hard, stupid quick to protect myself and to protect my family. So what I would suggest is, for me, this is what my approach is once more, if someone's robbing me for my stuff, just have the stuff, it's irrelevant. I can always get more stuff, stuff's stuff, right? Nothing is more important than my and my family's lives to me. So if people are going for my stuff, take it. However, if they want my life, my body, my family's life, my family's body, then I will fight back and I'll fight back quick and hard and fast. And then when I can run and you know, family as well, obviously. So that, that, that's my responsiveness, but I want to try and break that freeze response. And this is where taking, this is where taking action on a training sense can really help. Training martial arts, particularly Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, every day you're wrestling, you're fighting someone. And the reason it's good to, to do that is not only are you learning the techniques, but you're getting used to the physicality. You're getting used to someone manhandling you and responding. I'm half convinced that, you know, technique aside, the real benefit is that you're training yourself to act under pressure. You're turning that freeze response into a fight or flight response, which is significantly better. Now, I'm sure I've, I've um, sort of bamboozled you with a bunch of, of different stuff here. And, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna end with one more thing that when I'm sort of teaching self-defense and martial arts to people, the importance of looking at statistics. It's very easy, particularly if you've had a traumatic past or you've sort of looked into it, to feel like there's dangerous people out there all the time. Now. I don't know where you live once more, but the actual amount of violence and danger in in the real world is quite low compared to what your anxiety will suggest it is. You can look up the stats, but 
there's a lot less danger than what your brain will tell you there is, particularly if you've been a victim before. So what I'll suggest is a couple of things. Look up the actual stats so you get a real world view. Get yourself a therapist and talk through the traumatic events that have happened because they'll be able to break it down and sort of share with you the reality of the situation as opposed to the brain anxiety making up the stuff. And and and, and with, with that knowledge, you'll be able to go, okay, I know that this is the reality. I've talked through talked through it myself. And then what you can do is is work on avoiding situations that are legitimately dangerous. And once again, statistically speaking, where does violence happen the most? It happens with young, drunk men. Simple, right? Why? Young men have uh, less capacity mentally in the sense that their brains are still forming. Alcohol is a disinhibitor and males like to fight each other. It's, it's Once again, it's primal. So the most violent behavior and the most sort of assaulting-ish behavior occurs around when young men get together and drink. So we're talking nightclubs um, and pubs and that night scene. Now I'm not saying to avoid those, I'm just saying to be aware that if you're looking at the statistics, that's where we're talking. Can you still go out to those places and be safe? Sure, pick your place, make sure you're going with friends and that people know where you're going and trust your intuition. If someone's approaching you in a way that you don't like, leave, be confident and just trust that feeling. Don't 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 feel like you have to be a nice person. You don't. You can cross the road if someone's approaching you. You can close the door on someone's face. You can lock your car doors and not open it. You can let the elevator doors close and they can catch another elevator, right? You don't need to be a nice person. You do need to keep yourself safe. So, with with all that in mind, if you have any questions or queries or concerns about that topic of self-defense, please comment, let me know. I'm super curious to see your response to this because I don't really talk about that sort of stuff that much on this channel, but I do think it's necessary as a way to keep yourself safe and sort of deal with the anxiety to have some sort of working plan. So yeah, catch up.